Um, hi, my name is Kara Hamley O'Donnell, and I um, work for the City of Cleveland Heights and also run this historical center, which is owned and operated by the City of Cleveland Heights. As you know, we have lectures here, here um, every couple of months, although we'll shut down here for the winter. But um, I see some familiar faces, and I see some new faces, so welcome to those of you who haven't been here before. If after the lecture you'd like to go upstairs and um, take a look around, feel free. We have on our computer upstairs, we also have a slideshow of old Cleveland Heights photos that sort of runs if you're interested in seeing some of those. The bathrooms are through the door over there. And um, I'm going to do quick introductions. Um, this is co-sponsored by the Cleveland Heights Landmark Commission and the Cleveland Heights Historical Society. Um, the Cleveland Heights Landmark Commission is the, the board that reviews landmark properties here in the city of Cleveland Heights. And the Historical Society is a nonprofit group that um, is responsible for um, some wonderful newsletters that come out are we quarterly or every couple of months now. <laughs> when they get it together. So <laughs> you're always surprised when one shows up. Um, but also afterwards, there's many um, of their old newsletters over there. And their website, which is chhistory.org, usually can, um, has notification of events that are going on. By, sponsored by the Historical Society, as well as having a bunch of wonderful old, old photographs of the area. So um, if you get a chance, check that out. You can also go to the main Cleveland Heights website, which is clevelandheights.com. And under the links, you can link to the Historical Society that way as well. Um, I'd like to introduce our lecture, lecturers who also have books on sale. Um, after the, the um, lecture, you're welcome to uh, buy them, and they will sign them. Um, this will also be taped and shown on the Cleveland Heights um, cable channel. So if you see, are here and someone you know might have been interested, um, you can take my card, which will be in the back chalk tray at the back of this room. And you can uh, give that to them, and they can give me a call or an email, and I'll let them know when this will be available. We also put a video of this production at the um, Cleveland Heights Main Library also, and that can be checked out if people don't have cable. Uh, Roy Larrick uh, chairs the Euclid Landmark Commission, is vice president of the Euclid Historical Society, and is the director of the Friends of Euclid Creek. He's joined here tonight by Bob Gibbons, who is the president of the Nottingham Historical Society and a friend of Euclid Creek and also by Edward Siplock, who is a member of the Euclid Landmark Commission. And the Euclid Creek, which had just been released by Arcadia Publishing, is their wonderful book that I'm imagining some of the same images we'll, we'll see here tonight. With that, I introduce Roy. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. Well, it's very nice to be here on this snowy night. And um, I have had the Superior Schoolhouse and this audience in mind now for three years. It was just about three years ago that I was here with a, another colleague and we were presenting the history of Euclid Township at that point. And this group was wonderful because after our lecture, which had to do with the labor dispute between Moses Cleveland and his surveyors back in the summer of 1796, and uh, we showed how that played out into Euclid Township, which extended as far southwest as Cedar and Demington. The corner of Cedar and Demington was Euclid. So we are standing in old Euclid Township, or you're sitting and I'm standing. And, um, the, but the questions that came from this group revolved around the streams of Euclid Township. In particular, Dugway Brook, Nine Mile Creek, and uh, Euclid Creek. And I was really enthralled because I am a geologist, archaeologist by training, and my sense of history is from the ground up. You must start with the substrate in order for history to make sense. So I like these questions coming from this group. And I've kept them in mind. And when a chance came up to do some historical work, some more historical work in Euclid Township, Euclid Creek came up with it. And it seemed natural to me to, to begin a number of projects related to Euclid Creek and its history. And one of the outcomes of this is the book Euclid Creek just released that we're going to talk about tonight. And what we would like to do tonight is give a, a, um, a kind of scenes behind the scene, a story behind the book. We're going to take a few topics and try to expand them uh, using photographs in the book, but a few other things as well. And uh, one thing that we tried to do in the book that, um, that uh, I don't know how well it comes out because it's black and white antique photos, basically. 
is to give a sense of the watershed itself. So our first slide starts out with the big watershed, the Great Lakes. And uh, of course, you know them all. And here are we down here. Love this shot. You can see Cape Cod out here, the Atlantic, of course, Long Island there. But um, uh, the Yulee Creek watershed is just about here on the south shore of Lake Erie. So I want you to keep this in mind as we go through these slides. But uh, to uh, begin with absolutely here, I want to talk about how the book came together. And for that, we'll go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> and there's the cover of it, of course. I'll just tell you that uh, this photo was taken in 1945. And uh, there are two women with um, what look to be scarves on. And they are two uh, young Austrian women who uh, at that time lived just up on the hill uh, to the right and on Glen Ridge Road. And they still live there today. And they're in their 80s. And it's very nice for them to be on the cover of this book, okay? with these slabs of bluestone, of Euclid bluestone uh, underneath and the water rushing by. Next slide. Um, the, the watershed itself, if we could go from that satellite view to this, it's a kind of strange looking thing. And uh, we'll get back to this watershed, but I'd like to mention a few groups that have been instrumental in helping us put the books together. And that is the Friends of Euclid Creek, which is, I like to call, a crick-hugging advocacy group. And we have some brochures here for the Friends of Euclid Creek. It's a great group that has all aspects of this stream uh, as part of its mission. Uh, the history, uh, but certainly the health, the chemical, biological health of the stream, and uh, a vision for making the creek a better place in the years that come. Next slide. Um, this year has been a big year for Euclid Creek in terms of visibility and uh, study. <clears throat> there are two publications out this year. One is this Euclid Creek Watershed Action Plan okay, for the future. Uh, this was the draft in May. And it was done by the Euclid Creek uh, uh, Watershed Council, which is the nine mayors of the nine, it, I should say it was uh, underwritten by the, uh, the, the mayors of the nine municipalities, the Friends of Euclid Creek, and the Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District. Okay. And uh, we got interested in this, and uh, Gibb and I were asked to do a cultural resources inventory for this watershed action plan. That was the initial. And so the next slide. Uh, then in conjunction with, with that publication, the uh, Cuyahoga County Planning Commission has uh, come up with a similar thing. They call it the Watershed Planning Guide for Euclid Creek. But once again, it's to take stock of what's there and see what can be done to improve the health of the, of the creek and the watershed in its entirety. Okay? So also our cultural resource inventory went into this. Next slide. All right, and uh, once we had that underway, I uh, had been in touch with Arcadia uh, Publishing, the Midwest office in Chicago, and uh, they had asked me to do a book on Euclid, and I said, ah, I don't want to do a book on Euclid, I want to do one that has the ground in it. So as these uh, watershed action plans came into being, I suggested this, and it took a while to sell. You may know that the Images of America series of Arcadia Publishing has more than 3,000 titles of local history around the country. Okay? They publish hundreds per year. They're the only national publishing house, in fact, they're international, that makes money off local history. And they do it by uh, doing many of them and having them all in the same format, every book in the same format. But they do enough, and they, they're able to support themselves. So we got a contract on March 1st, and we delivered the manuscript on May 16th. And that's pretty good for 207 images from 18 regional archives, plus a number of private individuals who lent us photos as well. So we worked hard for uh, two to three months on this. And um, uh, this is one of the shots from the book. It's on the, uh, it is on the, uh, uh, on the page that lists the archives there. And I, I like it because it's an, it was a, this, this photo was taken in, eight, in uh, 1896. And uh, uh, there was a big tree then. You see the vineyard posts on both sides here. And this was down near the Nottingham filtration plant, where that is presently. Um, but um, uh, oaks, you know, symbolize endurance for us. And so I like to see this as symbolizing the endurance of our regional archives, such as 
Western Reserve Historical Society, Cleveland State, uh, Special Collections, Cleveland Public Library, and the like. Next slide. All right, I'm going to go through the uh, chapters very quickly, just a few slides from the books for each chapter. This one is going to be a little different because chapter one, our natural setting, it was difficult to get antique photographs, which is what Arcadia wants to publish, um, that, that gave a good idea of natural setting. So the County Planning Commission uh, came up with some maps for us that are very nice. They tell a bit about the watershed and I think are a good base to start in with the history. Next slide. So here we are, the Euclid Creek watershed. Just a tiny little thing. Would you compare it with the Cuyahoga watershed and the Chagrin River? Okay? And then we have uh, Doan, Nine Mile, and Dugway Brooks over here, and a few smaller streams between uh, Wildwood Park and uh, the mouth of the Chagrin River here. But you see, this is minuscule nearly compared with other Great Lakes watersheds and uh, uh, certainly some of those on the south shore of Lake Erie. But what's interesting about this is that from its uh, mouth at the lake to the sources in Beechwood, Pepper Pike, and Shaker Heights, uh, you rise from the lake about as high as you go in this region. Okay? So the Euclid Creek watershed is small, but it encompasses the Appalachian escarpment from the plateau down to the lake. And that's what gives it its character. Next slide. Okay. So a couple of maps show this. And uh, in uh, these couple of maps I have here, the watershed is outlined in this kind of ugly green line. Um, and uh, this one does a nice job of showing the change in elevation from the lake plain up through the, the portage escarpment, uh, a sub-escarpment of the Appalachian escarpment, and then the constant rise. When you drive up Richmond Road, which is right here, or if you drive up Green or Noble, well, that's out of the watershed already, but let's take Green and Richmond. If you drive south in those roads, you don't realize that you're going up. Um, you, you are going up. If you ride a bicycle, you notice it very much that you're going uphill. But our landscape is deceiving in that once you get to the top of the hill here above Euclid Avenue, you rise another 100 feet easily to get to Mayfield Road, and then it starts to go higher, and by the time you get to Cedar, you're up another 100 feet, another 70 feet, I should say, okay? So the, well, we'll just go to the, you can see that the sources are on the southern edge of what's called the Chagrin Highlands in Beechwood, okay? And Pepper Pike. Next slide. Now, if you were to, um, to take from the source area in Beechwood, Pepper Pike, down to the lake, you drop the height of the terminal tower, about 750 feet. Hard to imagine, isn't it? Okay. And in that 750 feet, you go through some major rock formations. And I'm not going to go over these in detail, but the top one on the heights, on the, uh, in, in Beechwood, Shaker Heights and the like, is a shale. And then under that is uh, some layers of sandstone, the Berea sandstone here and the Euclid sandstone and then the Cleveland Shale and the Chagrin Shale underneath that. And the Chagrin Shale is what gives, gives the character to all the valleys around here, those, those sheer, gray, undifferentiated cliffs that we have are usually Chagrin Shale. Now, the stone is important here in Cleveland Heights because the Superior Schoolhouse sits just on top of the Berea Sandstone, and Mayfield Road, Coventry, the upper part of Lakeview Cemetery, sits just on top of the Bluestone. So the drop that we have between here and Mayfield Road is, uh, is uh, over this uh, Berea sandstone here. And of course, it was the Berea sandstone used to construct the schoolhouse itself. Many, there are many uh, uh, structures around uh, the watershed that are made of either Berea sandstone or Euclid bluestone. There are many more foundations and stairways from the old days. And of course, in the 1890s up to about 1920, sidewalks made of Euclid bluestone especially. Next slide. All right, and just to show you this once more, uh, we have here the deep shales down here in this, in this area, and then the upper shales above those sandstones in this area, and then the bluestone and Berea sandstone in this lighter area here. So sure enough, if you go through this light area on Richmond Road, Green Road, you'll see from the old days the greatest proportion of bluestone and Berea sandstone steps, foundations, 
lentils, hosts, and the like. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> now, if I take you from the top down to the bottom, this is what you'll see about 100 years ago. Uh, this is just south of Mayfield Road, a house of the 1890s, and a cleared area for farming, um, slightly rolling, but I want you to see that although these aren't major streams, the, the ravines are not deep at all on the heights. And this is a function of lying above that resistant Berea sandstone. Next slide. If we start to go down, uh, we see where Euclid Creek cuts through the Euclid Bluestone at a falls. This is Anderson Road, and Green Road is off to the right, the intersection of Green and Anderson off to the right there. Okay? And the falls is about 12, 15 feet high here. It was called back in, in the earliest years of the 19th century, 185 or so, Euclid Falls. And it was thought to be a good source for water power and actually a source that would be used through the years. So the intention in naming it Euclid Falls was that it would grow into something like Olmsted Falls, Chagrin Falls, Cuyahoga Falls. It never did. Next slide. All right. Um, one of our, our great finds was at Case Western Reserve University, where there's a collection of geological photographs that were collected and or taken by an early professor of geology there. His name was Jesse Earl Hyde. And uh, he started teaching about uh, 1900 and uh, went through the 30s. They had a long career. And many photos were taken during the 20s and 30s. This one, as you say, in 1934. After the bluestone quarries at Nine Mile Creek and Euclid Creek had shut, uh, but he posed a geology student here to show the layering of the Euclid bluestone, the shale above and the shale below. Next slide. Okay. And as we head down the creek, uh, you, 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 get, you can understand that once in the old days, about 14,000 years ago, not that, all that long, once the creek cut through the Euclid bluestone, then it made quick work of the underlying shales. So this is what's called an outlier, a geological outlier. And this still exists just north of the Monticello Bridge. And you can access it from the Metro Parks Road just north of the Monticello Bridge. And you see the bluestone up here, resistant. It overhangs the shale down here. And to give you a, an idea of scale, here are some kids bathing in the summer of 1953. Next slide. All right. And a little farther downstream, the bluestone is up here, the Cleveland shale, and the creek is just starting to erode through the chagrin shale down here. Our three cover girls, again, in the winter of 1945. Next slide. And um, bluestone just out of the picture, the Cleveland shale, and then the chagrin shale down. This is in the area of Welch's Woods picnic area presently. This path, this very nice path, was constructed in the 1930s during the Depression by the Civilian Conservation Corps, and it quickly eroded away because the rock, this shale, the Cleveland shale, is quite friable. Next slide. And a similar view, more modern view, Welch's Woods, bluestone right up on top. The cap of the lower heights is the Euclid bluestone. So this is Richmond Heights in here. And the, uh, well, the, uh, the escarpment above Euclid Avenue is just off to our left. And then, all right, so bluestone, Cleveland Shale, Chagrin Shale. And with the creek meandering at the bottom. Next slide. I love this shot, taken again by Jesse Earl Hyde. And uh, this, uh, he wanted to show erosion here. But it's a wonderful shot of one of the promontories on, in the metro parks that looks northward. And um, uh, you can see how fragile the surface is, these trees falling and growing up and falling and growing up there as it erodes. Next slide. And uh, another favorite. Well, they're all favorites. We're showing you the favorites tonight, of course. So this we found at the Western Reserve Historical Society. It's, um, it's dated 1896 or 95. And it has a German inscription on the back. And I love it because you're, this, it's taken from what's currently Glen Ridge Road in Euclid, just before it heads down the escarpment to Euclid Avenue. And uh, as you look off to the northeast, you see the lake out here. Well, it's a little hazy, so you don't see it, but the lake plain. And then Euclid Avenue is right along here. And there are houses and uh, rooming houses uh, that were common back in the 1890s there. And Euclid Village was actually quite a going concern. You'd never know it 
from looking at Chardon and Euclid right now, but that's where we are. I think this is, well, there's the Baptist Church on Chardon Road, so Chardon coming up to Euclid here, and then Chardon Road headed up this way, and then down in what's the fields of the Metro Park's entrance now, you see uh, some cleared land, and then look at this, vineyards. Vineyards. Here's Highland Road, the bridge across the creek that's, oh, it's no longer this bridge, and Highland Road is no longer in that place. But nevertheless, uh, this is, when you come from Euclid Avenue to go into the Metro Parks, you do cross the creek in this way. But this vineyard here, and I love these houses, um, especially this outbuilding here with the truncated gable that almost looks like some kind of a European thatched roof on a dwelling, and it fits, this has a German inscription on it because it looks like it's in the Rhine Valley or something like that to, to me. Anyway, this is, this is what we call the mouth of the gorges here that leads to the lake plain that comes off the escarpment, off the plateau, and uh, then the creek crosses the lake plain to the lake. Next slide. From here then, we go directly to the mouth. Great photo taken in 1947 with a tug and a couple of barges out here that were involved in constructing the Nottingham uh, water filtration pipeline from a crib three miles out in the lake. Wildwood Park, for those of you who know it, you know it's a marina with a break wall. That break wall was constructed to, sh to shelter, to harbor these work crews, the work boats, during the construction. It was a major construction there, and certainly it was built with a recreational use in mind after the construction, but uh, its, its purpose was uh, serious there. And the uh, pilings here date to the time that there was a, a bit of a pier out here, and that, and that there were boats coming in and out of Euclid Creek. Not that often, but this area would be dredged, and you see the sandbar that regularly builds up to actually block the creek up, and then in a good flood, it, um, the, the creek will breach the, uh, the sandbar and clear it away. Next slide. And then just behind the sandbar is what's called the Euclid Creek Estuary. That is the area where the creek flows at lake level. This has an interesting geological origin. All the larger, the mid to larger streams along, this, along Lake Erie have estuaries. That is a significant portion at lake level. And they have that because uh, from about 8,000 years ago to about 4,000 years ago, the lake was lower than it is now, by 20 to 30 feet. And so the streams actually cut down to the lake at that point. But then it's Niagara Falls that rose because once the ice came off Niagara Falls, it started to rise. And it's still rising, and, but it's slow. So Euclid, the, uh, the water level in Lake Erie has come up as Niagara Falls has risen. And that means all the streams have drowned mouths. And you, this is Euclid Creek's drowned mouth or its estuary here. Next slide. All right, now we're going to go quick. Um, we chose to go with a transportation theme by time for our chapters uh, once we got through with chapter one. So we entitled chapter two, Walking and Sailing, to indicate what, how people got here from Moses Cleveland's time and before um, up to the coming of the steam railroad in 1852. Uh, this is a great find at the Western Reserve Historical Society. It's one of the original surveyor's maps, that is the protester's maps, um, that which I was talking about here three years ago. Uh, the labor dispute led to the formation of Euclid Township from, from two survey units, a square one to the south and a gore area. Uh, combining them together, you get the biggest township in the Western Reserve, and that was sold under contract to 41 surveyors who divided it up. And so along the lake, you see, you can read the numbers, 1 to 41. They gave themselves each a lake lot, and then another three lots scattered throughout the township. But somebody took one of these original surveyor's maps just after that, and they sketched in what must be the Indian trails uh, along this area in Euclid Township. So we have Euclid Avenue, prominence here, and St. Clair a little bit. And then we have Neff and Chardon Roads. We have Nottingham and Highland Road. And then we have Noble, Taylor, and Lee, and Mayfield here. Okay. And these were, these do not conform with the grid that all the subsequent roads, except for this little bit of Highland here, uh, and this bit of 152nd, but these are what they found. And what they found were streams that paralleled, I'm sorry, what they found was paths that paralleled the streams. 
the Indians and the animals. The Indians were following the animals. The animals wanted to go between the lake and the, and the plateau, and uh, probably as things dried out or wetted up. And um, the, the idea was to use the ridges along these creeks as dry areas that you could both get access to the creek below and the plateau or the plain above. Okay? So these were prominent in the landscape in 1796. And of course, they're very prominent in our landscape today. Next slide. All right. So uh, one of the early industries was that related to travel, anything related to travel. And blacksmithing is, of course, one of those industries. And blacksmith, the first blacksmith shop that we know of um, was started where Euclid Creek crosses the old Buffalo Road or current Euclid Avenue at Dilly and Euclid. And um, there was a place where people had to stop, dismount, leave the horse down, and back up again. Sometimes take the stuff off the wagon to lighten it up, to take it down. And I think even sometimes take apart the wagon to get it across the small chasm of Euclid Creek right there. So that's a perfect time to do repairs. And that's the business that comes. Next slide. Um, all right, and then we found a few photos that have, I think, marvelous uh, shots of uh, some of the heavily New England-influenced architecture. This is a house near uh, Mayfield and on Mayfield near Lander, current Lander, and it's a small one, but it has all the finery of a, of a New England house in having a larger main block with a front door and then a wing for the kitchen, which is smaller, but gives that kind of balance, you know, doesn't leave it a big block. And this was actually following the design that was perfected by the Italian Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio back in the 16th century. Okay? And it survived into the Western Reserve and, and became quite a thing here in the Western Reserve. Many houses look like this. Next slide. Okay? Another uh, great shot from the Western Reserve Historical Society of uh, the, uh, the, the residence and post office that was built at the corner of Euclid and Chardon in 1849. And this was quite a stylish house for them. It's a Gothic revival house. You see the tracery and the lancet windows above and uh, the uh, slight arch in the glazed transom above and the very fine side lights. Um, and it uh, bluestone foundation, nice brickwork, handmade bricks, of course, in 1849. By the time this shot was taken in 1890s, it had passed from the Dilly family to the Moses family, who were also entrepreneurs around town. And the residence that this had been built as had become part of the store. Okay? This is the sidewalk along Chardon Road. And so we're at Euclid Avenue here looking north on Chardon. Next slide. And uh, once again, stone is important. This is a great barn still standing uh, on Richmond Road just north of Richmond Mall on the east side. And it, is, uh, it has blocks of beautiful Berea sandstone with a kind of pinkish cast to them that come from a quarry within a few hundred yards of that. Okay? There are a number of these barns that still exist in the watershed. Next slide. Okay, Moving on, let's go to railroad period. And of course, the railroad came in 1852, the Cleveland, Painesville, and Ashtabula Railroad. And uh, uh, a good place to put a depot was at Euclid Creek for a couple of reasons. And uh, uh, the, early, the early locomotives could only go eight or 10 miles before having to rewater and refuel with wood. And Euclid Creek is nine miles from Cleveland Depot, so it made sense then. And this Moses family supplied firewood there. And possibly they also took water out of the creek itself to, uh, to rewater the locomotives. Okay? So that's um, a, a bridge of local stone. Let's go on from there, please. And with steam and the railroad came the first real industry in Euclid Creek and first real industry in Cleveland as, as well, um, after the canal era anyway. But one thing was then the commercial quarrying of Berea sandstone and Euclid bluestone. This is a bluestone quarry. And um, the steam is important for two reasons. One, there was the Euclid Railroad put in in 1881 uh, from the area around Monticello and Green down to the Nickel Plate Railroad. And then the other thing is steam equipment for cutting through the rock itself. And it's with steam in these two capacities that Bluestone and Berea Sandstone become commercially quarryable. 
So you get the quarries rising then in the 1870s, basically. Next slide. Vineyards and wineries also are a product of the steam era. Now, why would that be? Well, markets. Okay? You, as soon as the railroad came, linking Cleveland with Chicago and New York, you could get a market for both table grapes and wines, and both were important back then. And the other thing is um, the uh, steam was important for making baskets, and to pick grapes and to transport them, you had to have strong baskets, and these were, they could have been done by hand, but the steam machinery helped the process along. Okay? So this is a vineyard just south of Euclid Avenue uh, at the mouth of the gorge. Next slide. And, of course, a change in architecture came with the railroads and the early Victorian era. This is a house of the late 1870s on Anderson Road, right here. And this is the Malone house, and the Malone family was one of the quarry owners there at uh, Nine Mile Creek and Euclid Creek. And this was a very nice house in the watershed back in its time. It's still there. Next slide. Okay. And then the uh, immigrants came, or I should say immigrants from, uh, from uh, Eastern and Southern Europe, uh, came to Euclid Township and Euclid uh, Creek Watershed at this time. And so um, Bishop Rappe, uh, at, in, uh, in, the eight, in 1860, uh, I'm getting this right, aren't I, Give 1860, yes, established the first Roman Catholic parish east of Cleveland at Euclid Creek called St. Paul. And um, the church is there today. The, this is the first church, the second church, built about 1870. Very nice rectory and a bit of a school behind here. Okay, next slide. All right, and then finally, leisure starts to come in this period. And the first resort in the Euclid Creek watershed, this is the mouth of Euclid Creek. This is an 1874 lithograph. You can see the estuary coming back through here, right? Uh, what must be Lakeshore Boulevard we're here with this carriage. And then the Gilbert House, which was a Second Empire house, 18, late 18, um, early 1870s. And uh, Villa Angela, the big building, was built just north of this, so right in here. Uh, but the Gilberts actually had a kind of camp and leisure area there that was the first on the east side of Cleveland. Well, outside Cleveland. Okay, next slide. All right, chapter four. Uh, another change comes with the interurban railroads, the electric railroads that were put in between 1895 and 1898. From downtown, crossing Euclid, crossing Lakeshore Boulevard, or following Lakeshore Boulevard, Euclid Avenue, and Mayfield Road. Next slide. Okay. So the era of electricity comes with a big bang to Euclid Creek with Euclid Beach. Now this is not a period photograph, this is 1949, winter of 1949, but it shows you Euclid Beach. The point I want to make about Euclid Beach is that in 1895, when it was opened, it was the second electric amusement park in the country, the first one having gone up a year earlier in Chicago. So this was a precocious thing here, and once again, it brought electricity. Nobody had electricity, but the park had electricity and kind of instilled the idea for it. So within a year, you start getting the interurban railroads out this way and trolley lines. Uh, you may know that Euclid Beach, when it opened in 1895, and for two years, the only real access to it was by steamboat from the East 9th Street Pier to the Euclid Beach Pier here. It was essentially isolated. And there were a number, Coney Island was, a num was another early park like this where you had to take a boat to it because it was out in the boonies. All right, and Wildwood Park, of course, in the mouth of Euclid Creek in here. Next slide. Um, and Upland, then, uh, this era, the inner urban era, as we call it, was also the time when um, the, there had been, you might say, a second tier of Cleveland industrialists who were not filthy rich, but they were well enough off that they could think about building country estates. And a number of them, about a dozen of them, came to Euclid Creek to do this. Maybe the most well-known of this era is the Bolton Estate, okay, which is here. And actually, all that's in the photograph is, at least, yes, all that's in the photograph is part of the Bolton Estate, uh, which covered, I believe, 55 acres at that time. Yeah. And uh, the house is still there, and Legacy Village is just off to the right, presently. Okay. Next slide. Um, OK, so we have electricity. 
uh, in, uh, not in individual homes, but we have it for infrastructure. Uh, we have the wealthy end moving in, but this is a time when uh, services and uh, what we call mission campuses start to move in. And this is very interesting here. This is an architect's drawing of, of the second Rainbow Cottage. Now, Rainbow Cottage, Rainbow Hospital, direct connection there. <clears throat> but it started, Rainbow Cottage started back in 1871. And that was very precocious as a, as a, a facility to take care of very sick children, crippled and disabled children, as they were called in those days. And they, they began on East 105th at Lakeside, but uh, in 1901, they were 1900, they were given a $25,000 gift, which was pretty good at that time, to build on Richmond Road. And they bought a farm and they built this three-story building here that was very nice, all up to date, and then it burned three years later. Okay, now we get into automobiles for the first time here. About, we say about 1918, they came before, but uh, uh, we picked this date for a couple of reasons. Next slide, please. And this changed things, of course. And uh, the, the mission campuses, and I'm going to make an aside here to say that um, we, I've talked about Rainbow Cottage, about Villa Angela, and Villa Angela was a campus there at the mouth of Euclid Creek. And this is the Our Lady of Lourdes Shrine, uh, which encompassed 27 acres until pretty recently. And this was, this was uh, built on an abandoned winery, essentially, one of five wineries in that part of the township. Um, and it was owned by the Harms family, which uh, was a really going concern. But Prohibition came along in 1920, and they were finished. Okay? So they sold to these sisters coming from France, sisters of the Good Shepherd, who then, one of whom had a vision while she was on a pilgrimage to Lourdes, France, and thought that there should be a replica in Euclid. So this is what we have beginning in 1925 in Euclid here. All right, so, and this was, this was possible now because people had cars and you could build something like this, still pretty much out in the country, but have people come to visit it in their own cars. All right, and then Notre Dame College, which is just south of the old Rainbow Hospital, Rainbow Cottage, uh, Green, Green Road, of course, 1928, they moved out from Cleveland, uh, bought a farm, 50 some acres, 53 acres, and built this very nice college building in 1928. Next slide. All right, and then uh, Rainbow Cottage, we have a, another photo of it in the book, but uh, Rainbow Cottage as it was finally built in 1928, I believe, and it was a wonderful thing in kind of a Tudor style. And it rambled and rambled. And the idea was to have the children's wards on the ground floor. It was a big semicircular thing. Children's wards on the ground floor where they could get out in the outside. And then the nurses and physicians quarters and the laboratories and the like were on the second floor. So it was really a great thing. And unfortunately, it's gone. Okay? And uh, this is a picture back in 1953, I believe, when someone had donated the use of a very early helicopter to entertain some of the kids. Next slide. And then finally, um, the, close of the, the close of that early era back in, in the late 50s, this photo was taken in 1959, of the sucker catch, the common suckers, the name of the fish, um, by three, uh, three people from the city of Euclid. Uh, this was right at the end of the time when you could expect to get a good catch of fish out of Euclid Creek because in the 60s then it really took a tumble. And it's better now, and uh, we, it's better now. It's much better now. Okay, now lastly, our last chapter is what we call interstate lifestyles. And this is the period where the interstates come and really change once again the way we live in the watershed. And uh, I'll show you how. Okay, this is East 185th Street. This is Waterloo Road. So. North is this way, and this is the big old Nottingham meander of Euclid Creek coming from the south, flowing this way. You can see, well, if you look closely, there's some earth moving equipment and the like, and this kind of swath is beginning to build the roadbed for the Lakeland Freeway, Route 290, all right? And it gets built up a lot, and 
the next slide, not yet, not yet, will be uh, a photo of the culvert that truncated this meander, okay, to make a culvert about a quarter mile long that takes Euclid Creek under Interstate 90 then. So, what I want to say is that the, the whole idea for dealing with a stream the size of Euclid Creek changes in the early 60s with the arrival of the interstate. Next slide. And at that time, it's, we don't have to bridge the street. We can just put it in pipes and fill it in and construct our road. That's been the attitude since the late 50s, early 60s. And that has really changed the Euclid Creek landscape and all the watershed landscapes. OK, next slide. And part of that construction, um, this is the very beautiful stone bridge that is in the same place of the 1852 stone bridge for the original railroad. Of course, now it's the CSX Railroad. And the bridge was heavily uh, rebuilt in, well, probably a number of times. But this one has a keystone that says 1903 on it. Still, it's made of local stone. It's made of probably Berea sandstone or maybe Euclid bluestone. I think it's bluestone, actually. But anyway, and uh, this is a massive bridge. And the culvert that I just showed is kind of in this area here. And in order to get the stream to fit in the culvert, they had to dig it out. But they couldn't dig down under the foundations of the bridge. So they had to put this spillway in here to get the creek to the proper level. This spillway became a natural dam for anadromous fish, migrating fish. And this became a good fishing hole. Some of you may know it because if you can visualize where we are, this is, once again, the CSX Railroad. And just off to the right is Dilly Road, Nottingham Road. And there used to be a stand there, a garden vegetable food stand called Fruitland. And this is, even though that's long gone, this is still known as the Fruitland's fishing hole. And it's gone from native species to being fished for steelhead trout. And uh, this photo was taken in April of this year when there were some beautiful looking steelhead trout swimming around in this pool just below the falls. And the big ones, once in a while, make it up over the spillway. OK, next slide. That does our, that uh, is our, um, our outline of the book. And now Gib is going to tell some unique stories that we came across, and uh, with a little help from Ed. Uh, again, it's, it's great to be here. Um, just going to talk a little bit about the fun and putting a book like this together and uh, some of the uh, uh, intentional findings we had and some of the accidental findings and uh, uh, we just got the history bug and, and took off here. So uh, we're going to go to the next slide and we're going to talk about what happened at the mouth of the creek here. This is, a, of course, a current picture of it, uh, but we want to go back uh, to the early days, back to uh, maybe around 1814, somewhere around there. Uh, the earliest industry of the time was uh, William Gray, yeah, who started um, uh, a stoneware business here, probably with local stoneware, initially, local clay initially. But uh, in 1823, uh, we had, according to some of the history books, uh, there was evidence that there was a, a Euclid stoneware business that started and ran from uh, probably 1823 into the 1840s. And so um, we went looking for evidence of it and, um, and found in the book the, the, the thing. And, and the gentleman's name is Marsilio. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is a copy of the, uh, of the ad that appeared in 1823. And then this is uh, a picture of, of, a, of a pot that, um, and the story is, is uh, we knew that, that they were making stoneware there and significant to have it advertised and everything. And wouldn't it be great if we could find a pot, you know? Uh, but you're, you're talking somewhere from 1823 to 1840, never believing that there actually would be one out there. And the three of us got talking, and I think uh, it was Ed's dream to really have this happen. And uh, in mentioning it to Roy Williams, the president of the Euclid Historical Society, all of a sudden, one day, he had a memory of some guy coming in within the past two years talking about some pot that he had. And so uh, we got uh, his memory working a little bit better and found the name and tracked down um, the gentleman, Tim Kearns, who, who had one of these pots. And um, 
I think if you go to the next slide, there's a close-up. Really great, and this work is, is 1840 or before, and uh, you can see the, the name engraved there and the nice glazing, and the three represents the size. This would have been a three-gallon pot. And, um, and he, the Marsilio family actually was doing pretty well uh, to the point where uh, whatever, they, they weren't using local clay, they were getting it from down, I think, Springfield Way and, and having it come up probably through the, um, uh, what's that, that canal and, and, and into the lake and everything, to the point where um, they actually purchased a boat um, and named the boat after uh, the Agnes Marsilio, which was the, uh, the, the daughter-in-law of Leonard, uh, who married uh, Thomas Marsilio. And so that, that connects us to the next thing, because uh, this boat was moored in house at Euclid Creek. And, uh, and uh, what you find is in, in doing research on boats in the, in the lake, the, what's nice is you can get evidence because they, most of them end up crashing at some point. And in, in that crash, you end up getting where they were made and who was captain and that kind of stuff. So uh, the other uh, early um, commerce that we had was uh, someone was running a, a, a shipyard, Euclid Shipyard. Uh, three gentlemen, uh, William Tree, Rule House, and Charles Moses. You know, so we knew that they started this thing. Well, they ran, uh, he ran it at least until about 1860, and we have evidence of at least 13 schooners, uh, with the biggest one being over 300 ton in terms, and, and uh, here's pictures of now, the, the trouble with getting images is, uh, you know, you're talking 1860. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of images, although you're starting to get some. Uh, but these are images of boats uh, from a similar time and in a similar style that were, uh, we got from, from the people up there at, at, at Bowling Green. And, uh, but these, uh, these were huge um, buildings, basically, that were built at the mouth of Euclid Creek. And some of them housed there, uh, you know, you had Marsilio housing his and, and Treat building his. And then they were put on the lake and gone. Uh, if the structures would have been on land, they would have been the biggest structures in the whole uh, township at the time. Uh, but but uh, so here we have, ha have the, the, the Euclid shipyard. Uh, next slide. Um, another trek that we went on is looking for the Dilly House. You've probably all been on Dilly Road, and one of the early families was David Dilly, who uh, came and settled uh, near 1800 and had a whole lot of children. The Dilly House stood on the, on the uh, hill, on the escarpment there, uh, somewhere near the Euclid Cemetery, just um, that would be west of the Euclid Cemetery. And we wanted to find an image of that. That was the goal that we had in, in putting this book together. And, um, and so no one had one. The Euclid Historical Society didn't have one, and, and it wasn't showing up anywhere. Uh, we stumbled upon this uh, map from uh, 1936. And uh, on, the, on the next slide, you can see on the inside, right up here, about the size of a postage stamp, we found this image of, of the Dilly House. Uh, and so we thought we hit it big by finding that. And, and I don't know if you, uh, you can't see much from this, but um, it was one of those uh, very porous papers, and so it's, 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 it's very fuzzy. It's not a very clear image. So we sent Ed uh, down to, uh, to try to find this image at the, um, at the archives, at the, at the county archives. Okay, let's see, next slide. Uh, this is another uh, picture that, uh, that Ed found uh, in, in the Cuyahoga County. And this was, uh, why don't you say a little bit about it, Ed? This particular picture should have been on a real estate appraisal card that they have, but a lot of those pictures came off the cards. They were glued on. So on the back of this picture, I found an address of Chardon Road and it was 1575 or 1595, and I thought, well, that's close to what we're working with, so I took a copy of that picture, and uh, that's how that came to be. But this, this also was in that missing box that I was going through and found that picture. Yeah, another, another shoe box full of photos. Right, right, right. Yeah. 
and, and they need your help down there at Cuyahoga County uh, <laughs> because a lot of things are in shoeboxes or are, are no, no longer labeled. And, uh, you know, they do have some that are labeled, and it's interesting. We were looking for, I believe it was um, uh, next to the Bolton Estate. We were looking for a good picture of that other estate there at Dudley. Dudley Blossom Estate, and we got this kind of nice photo, but there's this gentleman holding up the address and, and numbers, big numbers, standing in front of the house, and it, it, you know, Arcadia wouldn't have went for that, but it was, it's an interesting uh, way how we do things uh, back then, and so next slide. Um, uh, this is a find, um, those of you who, who are doing genealogical work in the, in the area, this 1858 map, is, uh, is an early map of actually Cuyahoga County. And this is uh, a, f uh, a picture of the Euclid uh, Township part of it. But uh, if it's a very good map. And for this purpose, it's the first map that has the Euclid Creek actually uh, pretty well uh, identified and, and with all of its branch parts and, and all of that on there. But the 1858 map uh, is kind of hard to find. Uh, we first found it on a microfilm uh, and it's a little scratchy and you can get copies and, and blow it up and see the, the, the owners of the, of the land. And, and, and so if you're doing genealogical work, it's a really great map. And, and it does represent the area well. Uh, we were uh, looking at, at the Mayfield uh, Township Historical Society f through their pictures and stuff. And the, the lady there just happened to say, hey, you want to see this map we have sitting on, on the top shelf there? And she brings this thing down and rolls it out. Well, this is uh, probably the size of this screen here, uh, a nice color map of, from 1860 of, the, of this map. And um, we thought we had a, a, a great find there, and we let the people know down at the uh, Cleveland Public Library and at Cleveland State, and they came out and actually did the digitization so that uh, it can be shared. Uh, and so uh, this is a great map, and it's just because we're out there nosing around, stumbled on it, and uh, so it's just one of the cool things that happens when you're doing some of this work. Um, next slide. Uh, just to talk a little bit about Nottingham, that was kind of my interest in getting involved in all of this research anyway. Uh, my wife is the pastor of Nottingham Methodist Church. Are any good Cleveland Heights Methodists in here? Uh, you have a big church down there on Lee Road, that uh, Church of the Savior. Uh, that actually started probably near this schoolhouse. I think they actually did have some things in the schoolhouse, but the church up the street here, it's an AME church now, was the original, what became the Church of the Savior, and it was actually called the Fairmont Methodist Episcopal Church. That area was called Fairmount, which is, uh, you know, kind of no longer what it's called. But anyway, uh, when it was the Fairmont Pre uh, Presbyterian Church, it was on the Nottingham Circuit. They shared the same pastor and uh, Nottingham was the more prevalent, so it was the Nottingham Circuit. And in 1867, uh, the Nottingham Methodist Church moved from uh, the corner of Chardon and Euclid, basically, to St. Clair Road because of the railroad that came through Notting the, that depot. That area started growing a little bit, so they, they, they moved the church. And uh, if you look at this, you can see some signs of some, and I think, um, uh, Roy will have to talk more about the kind of architecture here, but, but you see an architecture that predates 1867. They, they had to have either moved most of the church or parts of the church uh, over to this area. And, uh, you know, this is kind of what drew my interest was, uh, you know, this was the early church history. Uh, when you look at, at Euclid Township um, and think of it in terms of, of going from um, 140th Street, over to to the um, to the to the county line, um, its its history, uh, its church history predates Cleveland's. Uh, you have the the uh, Presbyterian Church, the uh, first Presbyterian Church of, of East Cleveland. Now was the first church in the in the uh, Cuyahoga County uh, in 1807 formed there. And you have in Euclid Village in 1820 you have the Baptists, and then in 1821 you have the Methodists. So uh, much of the early church life uh, in, in the whole area is re well represented in Euclid. Um, next slide. Uh, this is uh, the Methodist church as they moved across the street in 1893 and built uh, this beautiful church. And uh, it has been added to since then. 
But this is a pretty cool picture. You get the gas lights out in front. Uh, and, um, you know, this was in 1890, a, um, a village and, uh, on the verge of, of being incorporated uh, in uh, a very different church than what was across the street. Uh, and uh, we're still standing and, and fighting to, to, to be an urban church now. <laughs> uh, next slide. And uh, this is the Nottingham Congregational Church that was standing in that, what Roy called the Nottingham meander there, uh, standing in the path of Interstate 90, the Lakeland Freeway at that point, and had to be raised to, uh, to put the highway through. Uh, and it was a beautiful building. And uh, it was a building that we knew was there. And actually, people uh, have come up saying that they were members there, but we didn't have a picture of the thing. And uh, this picture came from uh, Cleveland State, and uh, uh, it's a great shot of, of Nottingham Congregational Church. Next photo. Uh, this is the Nottingham Village Hall uh, that was on the corner of uh, 185th and uh, Nottingham Dilly Road. And uh, that kind of formed a triangle before the highway came through. And on that triangle, we had this. Uh, this would, would have been the Village Hall, uh, somewhere built between 1900 and in 1910, and then um, uh, Nottingham was uh, uh, incorporated in 1899, and then in 1912 it was assimilated, uh, taken into Cleveland. And, and then this became a police, uh, police station, fire station. And then in 1936, um, as cars, not these cars, this is a little bit before then, as cars um, were being more used by the police, uh, it became uh, one of six what they called boys towns um, in, in the city, and they were doing uh, you know, uh, youth work uh, with the kids in the area at that point. And that also had to be raised when the highway came through. Uh, so that was torn down in 5960 uh, as the highway came through. And I believe we might be, ah, yes, this is our last shot, I believe. This is um, a picture of the uh, Highland area, Highland Road area, uh, Old Highland Road. Uh, and this is um, a photo that came from uh, Friends of Euclid Creek had a photo contest, and this is one of the entries and one of the, I'm not sure what, what uh, award it was, but it was one of the prize entries, and it's a beautiful photo from, from that. To finish up, I'd like to say just a couple of things. <clears throat> this is the first of those 3,000 and some titles in American local history that Arcadia does, this is the first one that has a watershed title. And it was a little difficult to sell them on that because, as you might imagine, uh, that press is uh, very concerned with making money. And the, the idea is you publish local history with a title that people relate to. They live there. Cleveland Heights, for example. Lakeview Cemetery. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Fairport Harbor, there are a number of in northern Ohio. So when I proposed Euclid Creek, the first question is, was, who lives there? Who's going to buy this book? And uh, <clears throat> they did have to think for a while on that. And I, I, I found out just recently that uh, they gave our proposal to Marianne Morton, who did the two Cleveland Heights books and the Lakeview Cemetery book here. And she thought it was a pretty good idea. So thanks to her, maybe, <laughs> we did this book. But we're hoping that this sells well, uh, and uh, I'm hoping it sells well because, once again, my sense of history is tied to the ground, tied to the streams, the watershed, and uh, to me this opens up a new way of looking at local history.